Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dawn Farm Education Series. My name is Emily Kagan, the Education Series Coordinator, and I'm also a primary therapist at Dawn Farm Downtown. <coughs> Today's program on addiction and families will be presented by Dr. Lynn Malinoff. Lynn is the director of Eastern Michigan University's 21st Century Community Learning Center's Bright Future Out of School Time programs. <laughs> She has worked with challenged youth and their families, teaching, counseling, and leading for over 40 years in the K-12 education, as well as developing and directing an adolescent outpatient program for substance-involved youth and their families. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn Mata. So good evening. How is everybody on this, it was a rainy day evening? Excellent. Great. You know it's always a choice. Uh, it's almost always a choice. If you wake up and you're really sick, maybe it's hard to have a great day. But seriously, uh, every day I wake up and uh, it's really my decision what kind of day I'm going to have. And I, I bring that up because as part of my qualification, I try and be pretty honest about a little bit about who I am. I think it's, uh, I think it's worth knowing. Um, but I, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, done a lot of stuff because I'm old. <laughs> uh, so these are the professional stuffs that I've done, but I also have been around for a long time. Uh, I was married to two alcoholics, not at the same time, <laughs> um, which is good. And uh, my current alcoholic is sober and has been for a long time. And I also want to qualify by saying I've got 28 years of working in the Al-Anon program and staying pretty plugged in to the addiction and recovery field uh, through some professional development and, um, and continuing to grow as, uh, as things grow and change. But the one thing that hasn't grown and changed too much is families and family systems, and that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, I have one, you have one, we all have one, some of us are connected to that family system, some of us have chosen to disconnect, some of us have not chosen but are disconnected, some of those systems look different, we'll talk about all that. Um, I put this picture up there not to show off because the person that I'm sitting with, I have longer, longer hair, I gave up, I'm not. Um, but that, the person I'm sitting with is Claudia Black. And, I'd like to give Claudia a shout out. Um, she wrote a book back in the 70s, maybe early 80s, um, called uh, It Will Never Happen to Me, which was a seminal work on families um, and, and what the family systems look like. And I had the pleasure of kind of growing up in this field and my understanding with this person and her teaching. And, uh, and, uh, and so, and I'm still in touch with her episodically, and, uh, and like I said, family systems haven't changed. Uh, she's evolved her work and does a lot of work with trauma and some other things, but, but the book is still relevant today. So I think it's probably at the end of the information in your head. Um, this is my family. Uh, those are my kids. There are two more. They got married this year. I'm free. <laughs> um, that's more of an extended family. I have one. I'm very fortunate. I don't pretend uh, like I'm anything but grateful and fortunate, and not everybody has that. But a lot of people have extended family systems that aren't even real, you know, aren't even their birth families, but they have been able to develop systems in which they can um, thrive. Um, this is my parents. It's a few years ago, but they still live in my childhood home. They're 95 and 92 now. So I got good genes. That's good. And that is uh, what we do when we go to New York. We sit on a park bench and read books. Um, but this family system is not with, I mean, it's, it's highly imperfect, even as great as, as what I got given, right? Um, but I will tell you that uh, there was illness uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was physical illness. Um, there were situations in the, the generation before me that impacted how people behave. And so I'm just sort of standing on the shoulders of all those people. And I just bring that up because we all stand on the shoulders of all those people. We come to our lives every single day with a set of experiences, with a set of norms that were developed in spaces, whether it was in school or with your family or at your workplace. And all of that stuff kind of blends together, but we're going to tease out what a dysfunctional family looks like. Um, 
the, the term dysfunctional family, I mean, if you don't like it, make up another term. Basically, it's a family where people take on different kinds of roles based on some illness or level of dysfunction of one or more of the family members. And then eventually, everybody's joined the party. Um, I put this up there with permission. She's now in her early 40s. She goes to Allen. She has four children, a lovely family. But I worked with her a long time ago when uh, her father was uh, barely sober and her mother, who's uh, mentally a both of, of whom, her father's still around, still sober, her, her mother passed away. But, but this kid survived like a level of dysfunction you can't believe. And in part, when she talks to me about why she's thrived as an adult, why she's been able to have this family, raise these kids, vote, she's got a job, right? Uh, she came from a family system where those things weren't happening, is because she was able to plug into 12 step programs really early as a teenager, and she just continued. She took a, she took a year off, year, five years off there, but she always had that program to rely on and always had the teaching that she got in the schools and in the school that, that we worked together and um, that helped her understand her system. So I'm just hoping that Whatever I say tonight, um, if it, you know, one of my colleagues said, break a leg tonight, and I said, okay. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Scott, like, if only one person gets something out of what I say tonight, it was worth the time. And I'm closer to the end than the beginning of my life, so time is very valuable. <laughs> but that's how I measure it. Like, I don't have to reach all, I'd love to reach all of you. That would be really great. And if I do, you can all come tell me afterwards. But I am doing this because I know that when I got this information, my life changed. I had more options. I had more choices. I had a deeper understanding, and I had some hope. So that's what I hope to impart to you today. Uh, and this is the beautiful woman. She graduated. She graduated. Her kids were in high school and said, where's your uh, high school diploma? And she said, oh, a couple classes, and never quite. And they said, oh, maybe we'll quit. And she said, no, I'm going back to school. I'm going to finish. And she did. And it was at her graduation. Anyways, chemical dependency in the family. I'm going to do an overview, I'm going to define family. Um, we'll talk about the effects of chemical dependency on families and some things that you can do and some resources. Uh, I do have a bit of learning, but so I, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to try not to, I'm pretty long-winded as a human in general. Try not to be long-winded tonight because I may run out of voice. Um, so, you know, we, are, we have our families. We have our aspirations, what we're going to grow up and be. We have these people in our lives. And how does this all play out in terms of how we become and how we navigate spaces? And of these people, like there's a doctor and a police person and a, and a nurse, really old-fashioned nurse with one of the white baby jays, Louise. Um, so this disease does not play favorites. And I think sometimes even uh, when I was uh, ran the treatment program, which was back in the um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, you really could almost tell kids in school who were on the path, right? Because the behaviors start to manifest kind of early on for most people, not everybody. Uh, so when I talk about alcoholism tonight, uh, it will be interchangeable with any kind of chemical dependency. Well, I might talk about drugs and I might mention alcoholism, but the, the, the science of it is, has evolved, and I'm not a scientist, so you're not going to hear about that from me, and there are some lectures as part of the series that are worth going to hear about the science. But when we talk about the system, if somebody's there and they, they have an, you know, an alcoholism problem or a drug addiction problem or, frankly, um, an, an eating disorder problem or a gambling addiction, Right? Or they smoke, which some of you do, but I'm going to tell you if you haven't figured it out, but it's really hard to quit because you're addicted. And, um, and that affects things too. And I think more and more because there's so many more restrictions on um, tobacco. But uh, I'm mostly referring to alcoholism and anything that's a mood altering substance tonight. Okay? So I'm not going to talk about those other disorders, but some of these things do play out. Like I've met a lot of people who have grown up in families where, the, where someone had a a very serious eating disorder, and the roles were 
the similar, similar if not the same. Uh, so, what is chemical dependency addiction according to the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse? It's a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So, what does that mean? Well, that means when a person who's addicted to opiates takes opioids, they want to clean the garage. When I take them, I puke. <laughs> so their brain doesn't do with that substance what my brain does. When I drink alcohol, which I don't anymore, I quit when I was 35 because I worked with some really raucous alcoholic kids and uh, they could not understand the difference between I could drink because I was over 18 and not an alcoholic because 18 was a drinking age then. But, uh, so it was just easier to quit because I could do my work. And me, so here's another thing. I gave up alcohol. Guess what? It's like giving up green beans. Who cares? <laughs> you know, an alcoholic doesn't understand that stage, right? Uh, people drink, they stop after a drink or a drink and a half or half a drink, and they go, I'm a little tipsy, I'm going to stop. An alcoholic cannot understand that behavior. So they're, because their brains don't process things the same way. There's something different about their related memory and related circuitry, about that brain reward. Um, dysfunction leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. People are really wrecked by this stuff. And um, it's reflected in, you know, the pathology of pursuing rewards. You know, alcoholics do a lot of crazy stuff to get their substance um, if they need to. Uh, it's characterized by an inability to consistently abstain. So uh, alcoholics can sometimes they stop for a while, but can they stay stop? Right. So consistently abstain. Um, Impairment in behavioral control, I do a lot of crazy things, uh, sometimes some very mean things. Craving, diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behavior, so it's like, well, if I get as bad as her, then I'll get help. I'm not that bad, right? So they have very distorted perceptions of their behavior. Um, and like other chronic diseases, it, uh, it involves cycles of relapse and, and remission. And I remember when I first went into doing this um, this work with children with alcoholics and, and with kids with alcohol and drug problems, uh, the person who was running the major clinic from which we broke off and had this adolescent clinic said to me, if you can't handle relapse, don't do it. Really, you gotta, you got to know that it's part of the disease. And if you can't handle dealing with relapse, it's not a good place for you to do your work. Because you have to meet people where they're at, right? Um, so relapse is part of, part of the... Um, disease as is remission. Uh, if there's not treatment or some engagement in the recovery uh, activities, addiction is progressive. And uh, it results in, you know, death, incarceration, lots of bad things. Death is the worst one. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Um, it, so here's, here's what makes it a disease, right? It has signs and, signs and symptoms which are well defined. This is just what a disease is, right? A disease, a disease has signs and symptoms. It's chronic. That's the difference between something that's acute, you know, you get the flu. Not really, it's not a disease, it comes and goes. Um, it's chronic, it's progressive. If you don't do something about it, it just keeps going and getting worse. And uh, it kills you, right? Ultimately, it kills you. Um, so, the tolerance piece is always really interesting to me, you know. Um, I have built up tolerance for spicy food. And I wonder, like, that's different than tolerance for al I never built up tolerance for, for alcohol or substances uh, because I never consumed at a level where the tolerance, I would build up tolerance. But, but, the, but I know what tolerance is because now I can eat really spicy food. And, you know, like five years ago, I could eat kind of spicy food. Ten years ago, I could eat a little bit of spicy food. But now, like, I, I can compete. <laughs> um, so now, do, do people get what tolerance means, right? You take a half a, a, a glass or a glass of wine, and you're a little tipsy. An alcoholic drinks a glass of wine, and they don't feel a thing. Right? So they build tolerance as, they, as their use um, progresses. And um, if they stop using it, they're addicted, they're going to have withdrawal symptoms. They're going to get sick if they stop using them. 
And uh, they, they have cravings, though. They have physical cravings. They're real. The cravings are real. Um, they usually get drunk a lot, but there are alcoholics who may be weakened alcoholics and still get sick from it. Alcoholics, when they start, they can't stop. I know a lot of stories about people who were sober and then, like, in a blink, relapsed and ended up like somebody found them blue on the floor. In fact, it happened recently to somebody. No. Uh, it's a bad day. Um, and, and, you know, what got them from sobriety to, to, you know, relapsing and then just can't stop is that they pick up right where they left off when they pick up again. So, so if, you, if, you, uh, if you're an alcoholic with high tolerance and you drink a fifth a day, and you stop drinking, you get sober, and you're sober 25 years, and then you start drinking again, you'll be up to a fifth really fast. Like, so you don't, you don't go back to starting over, you go back to where you left off. That's just how the disease works. Um, the behavior usually changes while people are using, and, uh, and things start to happen. You know, they miss work. They don't show, they don't take the kid out for pizza on their birthday, even though they promised it, right? Things like that. Uh, legal problems are really, really common. Anybody know an alcoholic or drug addict with legal problems? <laughs> Anybody know one without? Okay. Um, drug taking in larger amounts, uh, you know, like, I'm only gonna, I'm gonna get three drinks over two hours at the bar, and then after one hour and three drinks, they're still going, and they go, well, I'm okay. And they keep going. So they, you know, they talk yourself, themselves into that, but in part because they have the craving. Um, and they have a great deal of time spent like organizing their life to be able to uh, get their drugs and alcohol. And no matter, you know, there's a negative consequence. This is, this is one that's really helpful for me as a non-alcoholic is to know that somebody who has a negative consequence, like they get a DUI, and then they go out and drink again and drive, that's diagnostic of alcoholism. If they get a DUI and they stop drinking and they no longer drink and drive, they might not be an alcoholic. They might have made a bad decision the night they got caught drinking and driving. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Questions? Anybody? Okay. Uh, and what about the psychological effects? Well, you know, mind, thinking, attitudes, beliefs, moods. Moody, they're moody. People who use drugs and alcohol are moody. Sometimes they're super high spirited and really fun to be around. That's moody also, right? Um, it's just a diff it's just the more fun of the um, they they see that life isn't possible without their drugs or alcohol, especially social life. Like I've heard people who are early in sobriety talk a lot about how they just imagine, never imagined that if they quit that they could ever have a social life again. Uh, but that uh, is often proven wrong, especially people who get into, you know, recovery communities. Um, lots of obsessive thoughts about using. Think about it a lot. And those of you who smoke know about that one because that's still happening to you. Um, and they, the, they have a love relationship with the drug or the alcohol that is more important than a love relationship with their family member, their spouse, their girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, right? First the drugs, and then the other stuff. So again, drugs, alcohol, alcohol, drugs, mood altering substance. Um, it's chronic, you know, the symptoms, they build up over time. Um, this is a big one, this was a big one for me. So it interrupts the developmental cycle. So, you know, I work with adolescents, and uh, their brains aren't going to be developed until they're in their 20s. You know that, right? Brains develop as us. It's earlier for girls to develop faster than boys. It's not a surprise, right? Um, I, think, I think for girls it's something like 23 and boys is 25. There's not a big difference, but, but the brain is not fully developed until sometime into your 20s. And I'm sure it's not the same for everybody, right? So some people it's probably 26 and others it's 22. But it doesn't happen in adolescence. Your brain is still developing. So what happens is, is it's sort of like you, you, are, you are stopping the social and emotional development when you're using as an adolescent. 
And so people, even people who get sober maybe in their 30s or 40s or 20s, but who started very young, I had, I had people in my program, kids in my program who started as early as seven, eight years old, um, developmentally, they stop maturing and it affects their, the development of their, of their brain. And again, I don't do the science. There will be other people who provide that. But that was important for me to know, like, why are these kids acting like they're in elementary school? Because they started using it in elementary school. That's why. Um, and they spend a lot of time somewhere where they can't get out. And, uh, and it may start with, you know, an acute <coughs> event or even more than one, but it actually just over time becomes routine. Oh, yeah, he's, you know, he's sobering up in county jail. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's different stages in addiction. You know, uh, again, I'm not here to talk, do all that stuff, but you know, you can tell. In early stages are not as recognizable as middle when you can begin to see the effects on relationships in life and work and and a person's functioning. And by the way, the symptoms are just like everybody knows, but that person, right? And maybe that person does know also. So it is fatal if it's left untreated in all kinds of ways. Car accidents, overdose, uh, you know, bad, bad medicine, um, doing violent things, making bad choices, finding themselves in a place, there's a loaded gun. I mean, there's a lot, you know, going to cop some drugs somewhere and somebody shoots them. There's just a lot of, way that, a lot of ways that, that people die from their addiction. Um, it's, it's not always because they took too much of their drug, right? It's because they made bad choices as well in the throes of their addiction and their attempts to maintain their, their stash or whatever. Okay, so it's a brain disorder. That's this slide. It's a brain disorder. So I, another piece that helped me very early on was these are, these are sick people. These are not bad people. People with a disease. You, you can go up to a diabetic and say, you're diabetic, right? I mean, huh? <laughs> but you do that to an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic, acting like a jerk. But, and they probably are. But the truth is, is their brain, their minds aren't right. Their brains, their brains do not process. There's lots of neuroscience now. Their brains are not like people who are not addicted. But people who never, ever touch a substance will never know if they have one of those brains or the brain of someone who's not yeah. So, uh, can you see that picture? Okay, so I've talked a lot about the disease, but now I'm going to talk about the family disease because really it affects everyone who's around. It also affects the people at work. It affects their friends. It affects anybody who's around them. Uh, but we're going to be talking about how it affects the family. And, you know, it takes, the, the disease takes hostages. First it takes the addict, and then the addict brings everybody else along. Uh, you may not even... You know you're coming along, but all of a sudden you look and you go, oh, this isn't normal. Uh, huh, what's going on? So um, we're going to talk about that. So this is a, a direct, I have some quotes out of 12-step literature. I like 12-step literature. And again, I'm not a scientist, and I work a 12-step program. It's optional. I'm not here to pontificate mm -hmm. about 12-step programs, but there's some good stuff in the literature. For those of us who are just learning, I use that literature to learn about alcoholism and the, and the family. And uh, in the big book, there's a whole chapter on alcoholism and the family. It's a little old school. It's written a long time ago. But the content's great. Sometimes you have to work on the genders. Oh, okay, whatever. Uh, the years of living with an alcoholic is most almost sure to make any wife or child neurotic. Right? So they get alcoholism, we get neuroses. Um, the entire family is to some extent ill. I really don't know any alcoholic families where anybody escaped without something, right? Uh, I know a lot of alcoholic families where they escape from that something by taking it and understanding it and finding some support for recovery and making some different choices. All well, this is meant to say that families look different, right? There are lots of different families, and there are also you know, what, it, what is a family? It's a primary social group. So it consists of parent, usually parents and kids, but sometimes it looks different. And 
we have to acknowledge that there are many ways that systems become family systems. They have the dynamics of family systems. Uh, gays, one way. Sometimes grandparents, parenting, right? Uh, this, I mean, I, I lived this with these girls I worked with in, in alternative high school. I mean, that was their family, and they all made the same bad choices together. Got lots of reinforcement for it. <laughs> But it was a system. And there were heads of household in the system, and there were people who played different roles in that system. So um, people have unique roles. That's part of the, the dynamics of a family. Um, there are some shared roles. Uh, sometimes you have two parents who both do parenting, right? That's a shared role. Uh, generally, if one of them is alcoholic, they're not responsible, reliable, and perhaps their parenting is less than ideal. Um, there are, there's a common set of values and beliefs, uh, spoken and unspoken. There are rules, spoken and unspoken, probably less of them spoken and more of them unspoken, but they sure are there. I'll tell you how I know. I became a mother-in-law this year. <coughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> it turns out, like, these kids that my kids married, Grew up in families with different norms and some different sets of ideas about how to do things. So great holidays. What it's like to get together with a family. I mean, I'm learning a lot. It's great, actually. I'm learning a lot and growing from it. But, you know, we bring those things to every situation. So um, it's important to know that. And, and so families are systems, right? And we're all, we're, we all are... This is when we're all together, but then there's all these other intersections about, and dynamics about how things work. But if you take one, if you throw one stone at that and you get a ripple in that Venn diagram, because one person is no longer fulfilling the role that they were going to fulfill, or they're behaving in a way that's erratic and not part of those norms and expectations in the family, it affects the whole system, not just that person. I know, you know, when I did this, the, I think it was the first time I did this talk, um, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you didn't talk too much about parents who have kids who are harmfully involved. Um, so, you know, the dynamics in the family, if there's one or more people who are using and using harmfully, are pretty much the same. The roles might so Who has the roles might switch, right? But the family really struggles. And especially uh, from a parenting perspective, it's really painful and difficult if you have a kid who's awfully engaged with um, mood-altering substances. So um, things reflect the change, like, like somebody's getting sicker or somebody even goes into recovery. Recovery is a really big change, and that causes all kinds of ripples. So just always thinking in terms of it's a system, you know? Systems mean that every little piece of it is part of the system, and if you move a piece, the system changes. The whole system is changed by moving a piece, right? Um, roles shift, the responsibilities will change around. Uh, how about those kids who aren't showing up for fifth grade because they're not taking care of their three-year-old siblings? We have those in the school. Yeah. We have too many of those in the schools, right? Uh, how about that mom who's trying to make everything better and is no longer doing parenting but trying to be a buddy to the kids to make it better. I mean, that happens too, right? It's just the best effort before you get into recovery. Try whatever you can try. Um, values and beliefs for, for the system are upended because someone's challenging them by behaving in a way that may not fit with those values and beliefs. And, you know, the loss of history, like, you know, you know, so what? And, uh, and denial sets in. Now, the denial sets in for who? Who do you think? Everybody. 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 The alcohol in denial. I'm not that bad. It's not that bad, you know, until it gets that bad. Um, but, but we all tend to minimize and, and deny. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I remember... Um, seeing a, a staff member drink out of a paper bag on my way into the building and not saying anything or doing anything and not remembering it till later in the day because my brain just turned it off. It was just so easy to do. 
right? I don't want to deal with that. It wasn't like, oh my God, it was like, oh, I just keep walking. Right? That's a form of denial. Um, it changes how it feels to live in the family. There's the walking on eggshells piece. There's a lot of things that change. There, it changes how people communicate. They tend to triangulate a lot. Do you know what that means? They, they, I don't talk directly to my spouse. I say to the kid, go tell your father. Right? That's triangulating. Nobody in the room's ever done that, have they? <laughs> we all do it. I still do it. I, I try and catch myself when I do it. But it happens a lot in the alcohol family. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, how the family members relate to each other, how they get along, how they protect one another, or don't pre protect one another, um, what they do with problems and conflicts as they come up. It's, it's all up for grabs in this crazy system. Uh, you know, so I think the first one's an interesting one, like how family members meet each other's needs. You know, that's part of what a family does is be available to, to help support people. But that piece just falls apart. Uh, I remember um, with uh, one of the alcoholic spouses, I don't need to say it, uh, one of the alcoholic spouses, uh, his son was going to get picked up in an after school activity. And it was in a building that was two or three blocks from the house, but it was going to be 8 o'clock at night. So deep, dark winter, you know, like December 18th. It was just about solstice. And uh, that person, that husband, Forgot, forgot, fell asleep in the chair. I mean, just forgot, was hey, and forgot. The kid never forgot. Hasn't forgotten to this day at age four. Right? I mean, he, he gets it and he understands it, but he hasn't forgotten. Um, how members assume their roles, we talked a little bit about that and how they meet the demands of their roles, um, and how they relate to the outside world. You know, we create our relationships. We, we recreate things in other we, in other relationships, so we take our patterns and then we, we keep them with us when we go to work or when we go to church or when we you know go out and be a friend. So we, we those roles and patterns we get into tend to no longer happen just in the family, but they it becomes who we are, especially for children without the homes. Another, another quote, the alcoholic is like a tornado roaring her way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead, affections have been uprooted, selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in for a while. Pretty accurate. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Um, I, I, I'm also going to assume, because um, I've done this talk a number of times before, that there are some people uh, in recovery some sober people in the audience, and welcome and glad you're here to hear about this. But I mean, that's, that's what it's like for the people in the household when someone is actively sick in their addiction. They are ill in their addiction. Uh, so lots of things happen, right? Lose your job, end up in the emergency room, get a car accident, have to walk the line, they still do that. Um, and the chemically dependent person can no longer live up to their commitments. So they feel a lot of shame and fear. And I want to shout out to those of us who are not chemically dependent that it's really, from what I've heard, I've heard thousands of open charts because they've been doing this for a while. Um, it's, it's a place of fear all the time to, to live with that disease. It's a place of fear all the time. And, and also shame because they're unable to live up to their commitment. It's not, it's not like they don't know. They know. They, they are unable to do it. A lot of broken promises, like the one I just talked about. Kids not getting a great job. Um, a kid who says, I'm going to school every day for two weeks now. I'm going to get a good grade on that test. And you find out they went twice in two weeks and didn't take the test. That kind of stuff. Um, members of the family are always hearing their hopes there. Yeah. I want it to be good, I want it to be good, I want it to be good. But really, what control do we have over that? Now I'll be talking about that. So here, you know, here are the characteristics of, of the alcoholic, the chemically dependent family. The alcoholic's in the middle and everybody else dances around the alcoholic. That's kind of how that is. A lot of denial and shame, inconsistency, just the stuff we talked about. A lot of anger and hatred, a lot of, a lot of feeling, really tough feelings in either, either 
you know, for a parent to have all that anger and to begin to hate what's going on with their kid is like horribly painful, you know, or for a, a, a spouse to to see what's happening and the, the effects on the kids who have anger and hatred towards their spouse because they're not reliable and responsible and, and really not very present. Uh, a lot of guilt, a lot of blame, resentments. Resentments are uh, poison. AA talks a lot about resentments being poison. They're not good for anybody, really. So um, I'm, I'm Jewish, and we just deal with all that for the high holidays, right? So I just want to so I'm, so I'm good, you know. Um, no, actually, interestingly enough for me, because because I've done this 12-step thing for a long time, like, I don't stack them up. I don't have a lot left, you know. I don't, I don't have a lot of resentments on this. Um, but they but they tend to make us all go more into the, the that rotten role we, we default to, or, you know, the, it's not, I don't call it rotten. The... Um, uh, the role that doesn't work for us anymore. And we know it doesn't work, but it's so easy. It's like, it's like putting on a pair of bedroom slippers, old bedroom slippers that are just, you can't throw them away, they're just so comfortable. It's that comfortable, but it's not healthy. Um, so it brings misunderstanding, fierce resentments, financial insecurity, that's a big one, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, anyone can increase the list. So, I mean, this was written a really long time ago, but really that list hasn't changed too much over the years. Probably not changed at all. I might change some of the pronouns and modernize it a little bit. Um, so, denial of shame, what it is, is you just say, this is an apple. <laughs> nope. okay. okay, I mean, that's, that's, that's the denial, you know. You're not an alcoholic, you're... You drink a lot, right? I'm not an alcoholic because he drinks way more than I do. Um, and and shame, you know, is also a big, big factor, and we all know the damage that shame can do. Um, anger and hatred, it goes with that saying, just share the story. There's lots and lots of stories. There's a lot of finger pointing, there's a lot of yelling, there's a lot of arguing. Um, uh, and sometimes the way that that manifests is there's just silence and isolation, which is a tough one because you never then know how it's going to pop out. Um, guilt and blame and a lot of embarrassment. I don't know about any of you, but I have been over for a dinner once and uh, one of my uncle's husbands um, fell asleep in his food mm -hmm. at the dinner table. And it was embarrassing, even though she was a person who actually understood and she, and she said, huh, I wonder if you relapse. And I said, nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hydeness to it because I think, uh, I think uh, addicts and alcoholics, young ones, old ones, and everything in between are pretty good at putting on a front for a brief amount of time and looking at like, their jovial self or you know, like the way you want to perceive them, but they can't maintain for a long time. And so they use, and then when they use, they become something, but all three. And then that's us. We have an elephant in the living room, but we don't want to talk about it. Even though all of us are really cute, there's probably a lot to talk about. We don't want to talk about it. Um, and we say this a lot. Resentments are like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. And that's not very effective. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the written rules and the, and the unwritten rules, which are, are, tend to be really powerful. So here are some, you know, family rules, Thursdays, mom's night, out of school, what comes before TV. I mean, these are all just lovely family rules. But in um, alcoholism, in alcoholic families, um, there's, there's three pretty prominent rules. There are more, but these three are pretty common, if not always there. And one of them is don't talk. Like, you may not talk about what goes on in this house, outside of this house. If you want to talk about it, you can talk about it right here. And if you do, if you do, some you know, kids come to school that had a really bad night, 
My mom was strong. Dad was trying to get, them, get it all put together. Kid didn't get enough sleep, didn't finish their homework. But they've been told you may not tell anyone. So they're not going to get any help. Right? I mean, it's a barrier to getting help. Um, don't trust. So how can a person trust another person if they've been let down over and three or four times okay? But every day, every other day, at least once a week, um, you know, they don't they show up, they, they, they disappoint, they say they're going to do something, they don't do it. Um, finally, oh, we're going out for dinner. Oh, where is she? Right? So there's a lot, a lot of... Um, Lack of trust. This uh, this son who didn't get picked up. It was a lot of work to build trust back with him. Um, for my, my this, the husband that did that. <laughs> uh, and then there's the don't feel. Shut up. You do not. You don't feel mad. You can't be mad about this. We we do a lot of things around feelings where we where we tell kids, look, you know. Don't be laughing at that. That's not funny. Why do you why do you look so good today? Why why are you smiling? I mean, it's very weird, and it comes out lots of different ways for lots of different feelings. But over time, kids uh, shut down and they stop expressing their feelings, and and oftentimes, and adults as well, they no longer really know how they feel. They no longer can connect what's going on in a feeling. And when you say to a kid who's been through these don't talk, don't trust, don't feel rules, how do you feel? Fine. Well, can you tell me about that? I feel fine. I'm okay. I'm good. And they, the no feeling words at all come out. No feeling words at all. It's with some, some help with them with vocabulary. So um, family members reduce stress by just pretending like nothing's going bad. Um, using defense mechanisms, that, that's the, the user and the family members. Denial, minimization. Does everybody know what that is? Denial? Oh, it, you know, it's not that bad. Minimization? Oh, it's not that bad. Denial? Oh, not me. That's not, that doesn't describe me. Uh, minimization. Uh, well, I only had, I only had two two drinks in four hours when they had a fifth of um, Approval seeking, victimization. These are very very common def ways that we defend ourselves when we're struggling. Um, and sometimes we take on new rules. We want to save the family. We want to stabilize things. We want everything to be okay. Uh, I remember. Um, this one family, this person wanted the, uh, um, the spouse was in treatment and they wanted to have kind of a normal engagement with the, with the kids. The kids hadn't seen the spouse in some days. So they bought some fried chicken in and went to the treatment center and got a nice little room and I brought a tablecloth and set up dinner and just had family dinner, which was anything but normal. But the person who did it said, that was, I thought, I thought that was normal. I mean, that's what we do. We eat dinner together. Yeah. And it's like fried chicken. Okay. Um, so we, uh, we sometimes do things and take actions to try and stabilize the family. Um, we have, again, a lot of children taking care of children and, um, and protecting the family secret is the don't talk more. So here are the roles that, um, that uh, Claudia came up with. Um, there's a family hero, the scapegoat, the lost child, the mascot, and the chief in the middle. And, um, well, what if you only had one child and two parents? What if you only had one parent and two children? Okay, so these, this is a menu of roles. And sometimes people play more than one role depending on the situation and what's going on, and they jump between them. But this is how the behavior looks. Um, so there's the hero, and uh, I would venture a guess that a lot of valedictorians have an alcoholic parent, not all of them. I don't want to stereotype, but high-achieving kids often are the family hero, and the way that they keep the secret for the family is they look good. They're super stressed all the time, but they look good. Uh, 
they're high achieving, they excel, they go over and above. They don't say no to anything, uh, take on leadership roles. Um, they have a lot of anxiety and feelings of inadequacy and I may be getting all A's, but I could be getting A pluses and I should be doing better than this and, you know, that kind of um, thinking. And as an adult, they have this really unrealistic sense of control. Like everything is great because I'm doing these, these great, I'm looking so good that everything's okay. So they can be CEOs, they can be presidents. We can have else. They take on, they take on big roles. And then there's the hero. Uh, oops. Okay. So they. I already said this. They offer the, the family a sense of, of being okay. Like, everything's got to be okay. He's a Victorian, for gosh sakes. Can't be anything wrong. There's the scapegoat. Those were my kids in the alternative high school. I loved them. Uh, they had done a lot of things that got them into a lot of trouble. But what's their role? Um, their role is to make, to, to deflect the attention. Right? So if they act out in school and get in a lot of trouble, then you're not going to be looking at the problems that are going on with the parent or with the sibling who's uh, actively using. Um, so they test limits, they break rules. I mean, they, uh, they, they're very creative, actually. Um, they can act aggressively. They tend to use a lot. Those kids uh, who grow up in an alcoholic family system uh, use a lot, and so they find out if they're alcoholics or not. That, that group tends to, to find out uh, whether they got that brain or regular brain. Um, they have a lot of anger and confusion and resentment, and it's all kind of intense and regular and constant. And as an adult, they um, tend to be the ones who have progressive substance abuse problems and sometimes end up in jail or prison. <coughs> um, so they, again, give the family and give system someone else to blame and a project to work on deflects all of the attention from the chemical use. There's the lost child, and this kid is the one who, and I, I've had these in school, because um, I'm a school person, uh, they just get really quiet, they do just enough to not get noticed, right? And um, they isolate, they do a lot of daydreaming, uh, and they just are quiet, They're, they have a lot of loneliness, they're very fearful, and yes, can a child be a combination of these? Absolutely. And switch in and out of different roles. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. And sometimes you get you get kids who are just classically just well, the scapegoats tend to be classically scapegoats. I mean, they're, they're just they're, they're kids who get in a lot of trouble. Uh, and they don't know why. Because they don't have this they don't have this information. They just think they're doing it because they're bad. But really, that's, it's a coping. It's coping. They're doing it to cope with what's going on at home, to try and relieve what's going on at home by just taking the attention off the other problems. Uh, the lost child is an adult, uh, a lot of depression, sometimes difficulties in interpersonal relationships, kind of obvious one. Um, and, you know, it gives the family a sense of relief and success because they're no trouble. Right? Not a problem. And then there's a the mascot. So this one's great. These are these are the kids, or it could be could be a, a young adult who break the tension by being funny. So comedians are often children of alcoholics. Very often children of alcoholics. My son is a comedian. I I certainly wouldn't have picked that for him. And I find it interesting because I've been talking about. Comedians being children of alcoholics for a really long time, and then he became a comedian. In fact, didn't even connect the dots for the first few years. Is that he is also a child of alcoholics. Um, so they're they're the class class clown. They're very fun to be around. They're very fun to be around. Very humorous. Um, they they use humor actually to keep you in an arm's length, but they're really fun to be around. And I still remember who the class clowns were in my own middle school. And high school experience, like I didn't make an impression. As an adult, uh, problems in school, at work, you know, they, they, they have a hard time forming intimate relationships, and it, you know, it's a crack of jokes all the time. Um, and they, again, they offer the family a sense of kind of 
So, uh, so what does a chief enabler look like? That's what I used to look like. This is what I look like now. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm still, I still can, I told you, it's like a pair of comfortable bedroom slippers to be an enabler. So how do I not do that anymore? I, I will tell you, a lot of phone calls and putting myself in check and a lot of hard work. I, I don't do much enabling anymore. So the definition of enabling, which is probably in the slide, you know, getting between the person and the consequences of their behavior. Right? So if I get in the middle of that, like if I buy somebody a present just to be nice, if I give somebody money for lunch just to be nice, that's just to be nice. But if I give them money for lunch because I gave them money and they lost money, and they weren't going to have lunch, that's enabling. That's the beginning between them and the consequences of their behavior and the choices they make. Um, so this is a person who shelters and shields using family and just tries to keep it all together. Really uh, makes a lot of excuses. Um, tries to soften any negative consequences because it's just too painful. Uh, anger, hurt, guilt, resentment, anxiety, fear, it sounds great, right? Desperate to control everything. And that carries over into everything. Like us chief enablers, we want to be, we want to control everything. Not just the alcoholism or the children who are affected by it, but also the people at work, the systems at work, the stuff in the I want to end nuclear war. I want to get rid of any weapons. I want to. I want to solve all the problems in our country, and then I want to take on the world and solve all those problems. Heavy. I mean, ways a lot. Um, and so we offer the family a sense of stability and protection. Obviously, I mean that's really the whole thing is to try and do all these things and minimize and control and organize it so that it doesn't hurt so bad, right? So it feels like kind of a normal thing. So one in four children live in a, a home where alcoholism or alcohol abuse is present daily, and that could be one of their siblings. Right? That just doesn't mean just a parent. Um, Question? Yes. Oh, so if the alcoholic is completely removed from the family, would the family have success not playing those roles? So I think uh, that's a very difficult question to have one answer for, but there are a lot of different scenarios. If they get help and they understand what's going on, they're likely to be able to make some changes. And if they don't get help, and this is true about anybody with any behavior, if they, if they don't get help or support, uh, then the pattern is generally continue. Yes. If they have, what, if they have stopped enabling, uh, if they, you might sense that they got some help, pretty hard to do. You know, you figure it out, but then how do you keep stuff in England, right? Because of the whole thing, I have to put on our cold room. Um, so children in chemically dependent homes, this is useful to know, three times more likely to be verbally, physically, and sexually abused. Because people do and say things when, they're, um, when their mood is altered, they are uh, traumatic for kids. Um, they're four times more likely to be neglected and they're four times more likely to develop chemical dependency problems of their own. So we do know that it does often carry on the um, They're a great risk for emotional problems. We talk a lot more about trauma these days. So when kids come to school and they have trauma issues, you know, they have these trauma triggers. A lot of those kids are growing up in these dysfunctional family systems, many of which are affected by chemical dependency or some other um, addiction. Um, they have health problems uh, for all kinds of reasons, but not, not least of all, they might not even be getting health services because people are too busy dealing with the chaos. Um, and they have learning difficulties, and a lot of that may be related to the trauma. But here's what happens. Those kids go to a dance and they say, I'm never going to be around someone who's like my mother, who drinks and has drinking problems, and then they find that person who's just like their mother and drinks and has drinking help. Because that's what we do. Then they get married and then they continue the cycle. And and we see that a lot. And we see that a lot. So how do we disrupt the cycle? So what if your child has a problem with drugs or alcohol? I'll put that in because the people were concerned. Um, so I went to people who had children 
who were harmfully involved and had either been to treatment or had been to treatment, but the people had this in their families. And this is, I, and I asked them, because I, because somebody had asked me in one of the lectures, I'm going to go do this lecture again. I want to know, like, please tell me, what do, what do people need to know from you as the parents of? And these are just some quotes, you know, interventionists really help give them the dignity to experience the consequences, and as parents recognize the consequences as good news, so a kid gets locked up, it could be the best thing that ever happened to them. That might be their wake-up call, right? And if you interrupt that procedure, they may just say, right, and keep going. And they stop. That may be what gets their attention. Um, it's horrible to have an alcoholic husband, but way more difficult and confusing to have an alcoholic child. This person had both. Uh, this person said, Al and I helped in the process of helping get him in treatment without blame or shame. And that's a big deal. Blame and shame don't work. But I think for most of us, it's our first go-to place. It's the blame and shame. Look what you're doing in the family. You need to go to treatment, right? I mean, that's a shaming comment. It's not productive. It is how you feel. Yes. So the question is, what about having strong boundaries with an adolescent who's using? So in my mind, having a strong boundary means when they're not using, I've had the conversation with them and said, if you do this behavior, this is how we will respond. And then not backing down. How far do you take it? To, to okay, so to I, I, I'm not doing adolescent treatment anymore. I will tell you that um, breathalyzing with adults um, is, is one thing that they do, but it doesn't get people sober. Uh, so I, I don't know that it will work on an adolescent unless uh, they... So, so one of the things, I, I will say this about working with adolescents, and, and I learned this from the kids. If I saw that their eyes, if I didn't see them take the drugs or drink the alcohol, but they smelled like alcohol, I would say, you smell like alcohol. You cannot be in school today. I'm going to call your parent and tell them, you smell like alcohol. You can't be in school when you smell like alcohol. I never told them that they had been drinking. Right? So I only called out what I could see or touch or knew. So I don't know, maybe in that respect, you think that doing a, a test, you know, would be good. But in general, in general, having boundaries is really good because these family systems don't have good boundaries. I mean, you hit, you hit it. That's what you got to do. You got to have boundaries. Here's some more wisdom. Kicking her out saved her life. Read that line. It's from a parent. Kicking her daughter. Kicking her out saved her life. Someone told me to go to al -Anon. It took me six months from the time of kicking her out to go back to al -Anon. Then I got help. In the middle of all of it, the important thing for me was recognizing that when things unfold, the consequences of their use and action, those consequences are good news. That kept up coming up over and over and over again. It's not in between the person and the consequences and the choices they made, the actions that they took. I don't need to make the connections for them. Those consequences are motivated. There it is again. Uh, from a recovering young son, God and mom are alike. They both never turn their back on me. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. But what does that look like, right? You know, I love you, but I'm going to hold you accountable. That's what that is. You have boundaries, and you stick to them. So is there hope? Yeah. So what's a family to do? Uh, first, you have to understand you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it, because it's a disease. You can't cause somebody to have a disease. You can't give somebody cancer. You can't give somebody high blood pressure, but that might be debatable. <laughs> you can't give somebody a heart attack, much as somebody might argue with you. You can't. Uh, so those things are really important to know, right? Uh, and you don't have to have the whole world on your shoulders. Because there are communities and places you get help. And uh, it looks like this, and the, the load gets a lot lighter when there's a lot more hands on raising that problem up. So a systemic disease needs systemic treatment. Uh, most, a lot of people need treatment. Some people go to AA. Some people spontaneously recover in church. Whatever works. There are a lot. Of, there are a lot of different ways people recover. Um, chemically dependent families have choices. They can break the unhealthy norms, right? So that's what you were asking about. Can can those roles change? Yes, they they can change. 
Um, it doesn't matter why these rules were developed. They don't have to be maintained. They serve the purpose. When the kids develop that role and that kid becomes the mascot and is breaking the tension every time it gets so bad that nobody can stand it anymore, they, they you know, pull their pants down and moon the whole family, whatever they do, right? That breaks the tension and they helped. But you know, that is not a good behavior to do when you're on Right? And, uh, and using humor to break the tension is, uh, is in, in an unhealthy family is, uh, becomes something that could get in some trouble later on. The alcoholic may find it hard to establish friendly relationships with his children. They cannot seem to forgive and forget. In time, they will see he is a new man, and in their own way, they will let him know it. From this point on, progress will be rapid. So this is from um, the family afterward. It's a great book chapter. You know, if you have a chance to pick up a, an AA big book and read that chapter about the family. Again, it was written a long time ago, so like the dad's always the alcoholic, and you know, there's all this sort of uh, pigeonholing that was more common back then. But the content's good. So, parent of an addicted child, spouse of an addict, um, uh, and here are some possibilities. Seek professional help. There's a lot of good professionals out there. Dawn Farmer has a long list of how you can help, get help. Uh, you can reach out to um, a therapist and, and tell the therapist why you're reaching out and do they know anyone with a specialty in working with alcoholism and chemical dependency and, and dysfunctional family systems or codependency as we are known. Um, learn about codependency and enabling. Learn not to enable. Learn to set those boundaries and stick to them, right? Um, I, you know, I'm happy after this. This is not an ALM talk. I think there is an ALM session, yes, where they do the piano. Not this time? No. It, it'll be in April. In April. Okay. So, so come back for that. But if you have questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to ask, answer them after, after the talk. Um, and uh, again, here's a couple of clues about enabling. Because you know, that's, our, yeah, that's what we do if we're in those families, is that one way or another, you know. If you're the mascot and you break the tension, you just enable that person to not have the consequences of somebody's wrath, maybe. Um, so standing between a person and his or her consequences, that's a big one. Doing for someone something he or she should be doing for him or herself. And engaging in actions that ultima ultimately perpetuate someone's problematic behavior. I love the middle one. Like, stop doing things for your kids that they can do for themselves. Did you ever establish that with them? You've been doing their laundry all this time, and you got to teach them how to do the laundry. Then you have a little party and you say, oh, damn, you did that yourself. Let's, have, let's celebrate. Now you can do that yourself. You're independent for that day. Right? Defining party. Well, I have defined party. You know, I, I just heard someone give a lecture where they talked about how with their young children and young children, so this is a parenting thing, but I think it would be great in a recovering family. Where every time they taught one of their young children, I think their kids are like five or eight, uh, every time that, that child could do something for the first time on their own, like tie their shoes, that's a simple one, right? The kid tied their shoes, came in all by themselves, tied their shoes. They all stop and sing a song together mm -hmm. and celebrate and talk about how this child now can tie their shoes by themselves and can go out and celebrate every time they put their shoes on that they learn to tie them. <coughs> Like how powerful is that? God, I'm passing it on. I've been passing it on a lot. I, you know, I wish I had that in my kids' book. Um, this is from um, the Howie Allen Works book, which is a kind of a grim one. Um, we who live or have lived with the problem of alcoholism understand as perhaps few others can. We too were lonely and frustrated, but in Allen we discover that no situation is really hopeless and that it is possible to find contentment, even happiness whether the alcoholic is still drinking or not. And I get asked frequently why I go to those darn meetings, and I say, because I am happy as a result of having a community in which I can, uh, I was able to share my burden and can now give back. That's my choice. That's, how, that's something that has helped me a lot. Other people find other communities, the church, other ways that communities are organized, but being around other people and being able to share and get support from other people is really huge. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So I, I always put that up there. I know some people have heard me talk about the Q-tip before, but put one in your pocket, and the next time an alcoholic or a drug addict says something really mean-spirited or, you know, does something really not so horrible, just rub that Q-tip and remember to quit taking it personally that they're in their disease. It's not a bad idea. It feels like it's a bad idea, but you really can learn to not take that personally. That will help the alcoholic. That is a not enabling behavior. Uh, the family situation is bound to approve, pr again, there's a little bit of Alan and I, as we apply the Alan and I ideas, without such spiritual help, living with an alcoholic is too much for most of us. Our thinking becomes distorted by trying to force solutions, and we become irritable and unreasonable at that moment. I put it up because that last part, become we become irritable and unreasonable without knowing it, just nails it for me. Because I don't know that's happening, and then suddenly I'm miserable. And I just want to strangle the person. Right? And I don't know how I got there because I'm not a mean person. But I still want to strangle them. Uh, the battle gets so it's work. I mean, that, this is the other thing. Whether you do it through AMA, through therapy, some sort of group counseling, family counseling, uh, the battle against the alcoholism has become the basis for many of our relationships. I mean, it, it takes a lot of space and time. Putting an end to this battle requires completely redefining what we believe about ourselves, others, and our relationships. And you really, that really, that's why when, when this young person asked me about, you know, if, you, if the family is left alone and just dissociated for now, um, can they get a better look? Well, they can, but they have to redefine what they believe and they have to get those relationships put back together. And, and that's some more thing. It's pretty hard to do in the absence of having somebody from the outside who's not in denial, who can see what's going on, just help you see what's going on and give you some frameworks that you can so you can understand it. So you can get motivated to do it because you can see what it is you're doing. So love the person and hate the disease. If I tell you one thing tonight, just remember that. Love the person, hate the disease. Sucks. Bad disease. So um, there is light at, at the end of all this. There's a rainbow over there. Um, and and uh, people get better a lot. And being around people who have gotten better who will share their story is really helpful. Uh, going to open AA meetings helped me a lot to understand the disease and not take it personally. Because I kept hearing the same patterns over and over. I heard about fear. I heard about well, I'm making these bad choices. And I was like, Wow, so everybody has a different story and they're all doing the same stuff, right? And there's these patterns. And I could begin to see that, you know, there's these symptoms when I get a cold, my nose starts to run, my eyes start to itch, and my ears get a little plugged up. It's not different. They have, this, they have these symptoms that manifest. Uh, and that's how I'm able to understand that it's a disease. Uh, so questions? Uh, now, any questions that are lingering, please bring them on. Yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tough disease. You know, alcoholics don't, they, they're alcoholics because they, they, they don't choose a disease. You know, they don't take that first drink and go, man, I want to be an alcoholic. Every once in a while, you're some smart alec in their open talk say, I want to be an alcoholic. The first day, it's every drink. But most people don't want to become sick and hurt people. Why would they do that, right? That's, that's not, so, so this is a disease that's progressive. And, some people really struggle uh, with recovery, and they need to be respected for the human that they are, and you don't have to like their disease, but love them, don't enable them. I mean, I, you know, I sit in meetings, and every once in a while somebody comes in, and they die. It's, it's awful. It's awful, and because I, you know, uh, my husband, is, my husband uh, also works a program we do, we've gone to lots of open talks, and, you know, big meetings and stuff. It's, it's a fatal disease. I mean, I'm here to tell you. People die from this. People also recover from this. Right? The good news is, is people recover from this. So move towards that. You're all recovered. What do they tell you when you get on an airplane? And they're doing, you know, they're up there. Now it's on the monitor, but they tell you. It's going to drop down and put the oxygen mask on yourself first before assisting any children or spouses or alcoholics. Right? <laughs> Put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Nobody cares more about you than you. Right? So while the person's acting out and doing their thing and they haven't gotten the help yet, I need to get 
myself healthy if I'm going to be able to be any good in that system. I come first. My health comes first. Then I can be helpful. If I'm unhealthy, I'm not helpful. I'm making bad choices. I'm just contributing to the mess. Yes. Well, there are people who work with children and explain it and help parents do that. So she finds a good child therapist and, and gets some help with that. There's a guy, Jerry Moe. Uh, you, you can look him up. And I guess he's got some stuff online. Magnificent with children. Moe. Jerry Moe. He does the children's program at the Betty Ford Center. Betty Ford, yeah. And he sometimes comes to town. I mean, I, I haven't actually seen him around here. I see him at a different conference I go to. But look up Jerry Moe. He himself, or he's, he's out of it. He's, he's a child of an alcoholic. My age. It, uh, he's just done a magnificent job with family systems and young children. I've seen him <coughs> work with those kids. So maybe there's some YouTube stuff. I mean, I don't know what you can find, but I would check out Jerry Mill. Maybe they could even call Jerry Mill and say, I heard that you know how to, what would you recommend? I'd call him. He'd get through it and he'll talk to you. He's a really big guy. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that question that I just answered was about what do you do with a three-year-old who you know, has abandonment issues and feels responsible for the parent being gone, the parents being gone. Okay, yeah? Are there more narcissistic personality disorders in alcoholics yes. and, and yes. non-alcoholics? You know, I don't know the data on that. I, I do uh, know some alcoholics <laughs> who have narcissistic personality disorder. I know, I know there's, there's actually some people out there who are on TV a lot who have that. Yeah. What do, you, what do you do first? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? If there's dual diagnosis and yes. so me mental illness, in this particular case, mental illness yes. and addiction, yes. you get professionals in and tease that out. That's what you do. That's what I, I mean. I, I, I don't have an answer to that. It's very complicated. Yes. It's very difficult to know which of the, is this mental I mean, because um, active alcoholism looks like mental illness, you know? It, it does. It looks very much like, and it's referred to in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous as, uh, you know, mental defective. So, uh, so it looks a lot like that, even though it's a, a different code is a different disorder. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying addiction is a primary disease, so if there's a coexisting um, problem, you know, addiction is primary, and, and I will uh, certainly say that um, if you know, if you have addiction and you have this other disorder going on, that uh, for sure, me as a layperson, I wouldn't touch it with a, I, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't have any advice to give somebody about how to negotiate that because there's depression, there's also, are they using depressants? It's very complicated. So finding a professional who knows how to deal with comorbidity is really important. And how they deal with it is they address multiple facets of the problems simultaneously and, and you need somebody who knows how to do that very complicated. Bribe them? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's kind of like um, I don't really believe in, in using the external rewards. I like the intrinsic stuff, but you know, sometimes you get a kid to try the spinach, you gotta just like get them to try the spinach. And then they might like it. Right? There is now an ALT meeting on Wednesday nights at Zion Lutheran Church at 7.30 at the same time as an ALT and an AME. Um, what city? Here in Ann Arbor. You can see me afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So it's a pretty well attended ALT group of, you know, when I walk by there, it looks like there's a bunch of ages. You know, that does start on that any, any, I think two digits, you just have to have two digits, right? Yeah, it's hard to get an ALT meeting to part, but this one, because there's both of the other uh, 12 step meetings. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Then come see me after if you want more information about that. Yeah, one more question. Yes, there, are there any online ailments? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yep. It won't be our good And again, if uh, somebody wants to explore Alan, I offered this last time too. If you want to explore it a little bit, I know there's some good meetings here in town and I'm happy to share that information. I mean, just meetings that, that are pretty solid. Uh, a lot of people attending who got a lot of time for the program. You've been a great audience with great questions. Thank you for coming to me.